You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center presents Prison Litigation Reform Act Update, an FJTN program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. This broadcast is a videotaped and edited version of a lecture presented at the Center's National Workshop for District Judges in Baltimore, Maryland. The lecture was given on August 11, 1999 by Lynn S. Branham, a visiting professor of law at the University of Illinois College of Law in Champaign, Illinois. I am here today uh, to talk to you about the Prison Litigation Reform Act. Now, the Prison Litigation Reform Act was enacted in April of 1996. It had two ostensible purposes. Uh, first purpose was to curb uh, the number of frivolous lawsuits that were filed by prisoners. And the second uh, purpose was to end what Congress perceived as judicial micromanagement of correctional systems. To meet that first purpose, what Congress did is erect a number of hurdles that prisoners must cross over before the court will uh, get, through the, get to the stage of processing um, motions to dismiss, uh, summary judgment, et cetera. Now, that first hurdle is an exhaustion requirement found in 42 U.S.C. Section 1997EA. And basically, this provision uh, says that no action shall be brought uh, uh, under Section 1983 or any other federal law uh, by a prisoner uh, until, until such administrative remedies as are available have been exhausted. Now, to really understand the significance of this provision and some of the issues that are coming before the court, we have to understand uh, and take a look at what exhaustion, the exhaustion provision uh, that preceded the PLRA, because there are some um, major changes that have been effected by the PLRA. Under the pre-PLRA law, uh, exhaustion was discretionary. Uh, if the court felt that exhaustion was appropriate and in the interest of justice, uh, the court could require that the inmate exhaust uh, administrative remedies, whereas now exhaustion is mandatory. Secondly, under the prior law, the prisoner could only be required, uh, or I should say that adjudication of the claim would only be de deferred for 180 days. In other words, if the correctional officials had not uh, processed the grievance within that 180-day period, the stay would be lifted. And all of that, um, that time cap is, is now gone uh, in, the, in the PLRA. So there are no time limitations on the face of the provision for the processing of these grievances. A third, under the prior law, an inmate could be required to exhaust grievance, uh, grievance, the grievance procedure uh, only if the pr process either met certain requirements under a statute known as the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act or had otherwise been found to be fair and effective by the court. So there were some real substantive requirements that had to be met. Um, and those statutory standards, for example, required that there be expedited processing of emergency grievances. All that language is now gone. There's no longer reference to a need for the remedies to be fair and effective or, uh, as it said uh, elsewhere in that pre-PLRA statute, plain, speedy, and effective. The only substantive requirement that's on the face of the current exhaustion requirement is that the remedies be available, although that one little word has created uh, an enormous amount of litigation. And then the fa under, under the pre-PLRA law, the exhaustion provision only applied to state and local inmates, and under the current law, the exhaustion requirement also applies to federal inmates. Now there are a number of issues that are raised by this uh, PLRA exhaustion requirement. It is one of the most hotly litigated provisions in the PLRA. One of the questions raised by the PLRA is, uh, is this exhaustion requirement jurisdictional? And thus far, most of the courts have concluded that it is not. And one of the reasons why they have concluded that it's not a jurisdictional requirement, in other words, failure to exhaust does not deprive the court of subject matter jurisdiction, is that there is another provision in the PLRA 
which provides you with the authority to dismiss a claim because it is a prisoner's claim because it is frivolous, for example, or fails to state a claim. And you can do that even if the inmate has not exhausted administrative remedies. So what the courts have, have concluded, they've said, well, the, we wouldn't have the authority to dismiss for frivolous, frivolousness if the exhaustion requirement was jurisdictional. So again, um, most of the courts have concluded this is not a jurisdictional requirement. Now, probably the most controversial issue concerned, or, I'm sorry, raised by the PLRA is this. What if an inmate is seeking damages in a lawsuit, wants to seek, obtain damages in a lawsuit, but damages are not available through the grievance process? Uh, does the exhaustion requirement still apply? And the courts are, are very much split on this issue. The Fifth, Ninth, and Tenth Circuits have concluded that in this particular situation, exhaustion is not required. And let, let's look at, at some of the reasons for their conclusion. Uh, first of all, these courts that have concluded that exhaustion is not required when the inmate is, is only seeking damages. Um, and let me, let me let's, let's give this kind of a practical bent. Let's give a real scenario so we can understand the issue. Let's, let's assume that we have uh, an inmate who's diabetic uh, and he alleges that because of the deliberate indifference uh, of uh, the medical officials and prison officials to his serious medical need, he had to have a leg amputated. And he wants to sue for damages, but that grievance process um, uh, or damages are not available, monetary relief not available through that process. Now, again, must he exhaust? And the courts concluding that he does not have to exhaust have first pointed to the text of the exhaustion provision. Let's go ba back and take a look at that. They have s pointed out that this provision only requires exhaustion of administrative remedies. The provision does not speak of a need to exhaust the institutional grievance procedure. And elsewhere in the PLRA, there is a reference to administrative grievance procedures. So these courts are saying that this, this textual, um, that, that this difference in language has substantive import. Uh, secondly, these courts concluding that exhaustion is not needed have, have uh, observed that in their opinion, the purposes of the exhaustion requirement would not be furthered through exhaustion in this context. Now, there are two purposes of an exhaustion administrative remedies requirement. One of the purposes furthered by exhaustion is to protect agency authority. But these courts have um, opined that agency authority is not protected through exhaustion here because the agency doesn't have any authority to award damages. And secondly, a second purpose served by exhaustion is that it does uh, promote and further judicial efficiency. Of course, the hope is that through the exhaustion process, the, the problem will be resolved and uh, you won't be uh, burdened with the prisoner's claim. And basically what these courts have said is that um, this, this matter will not be resolved through the grievance process since that inmate who lost his, his leg uh, cannot get the damages that he is, is, is seeking. Another... Do you think that uh, the states ought to change their grievance procedures so they could award damages through an administrative process of some well, kind? Well, in, instead of uh, uh, expressing my opinion, let me just tell you that one of the circuits that, have con that has concluded that uh, exhaustion is not required when damages are unavailable the Fifth Circuit has simply made that point. The, the Fifth Circuit has said there is nothing that prevents the prison officials from changing their uh, grievance processes so that monetary relief can be awarded, or perhaps there might be some legislative changes that are, that are needed. But uh, so again, that's really the, the point that you're making, uh, which, which is, the, and again, the question was whether or not um, these grievance processes should be changed uh, to permit the award of damages and, and really the fact that they can be changed is one reason for at least one circuit's uh, belief that exhaustion is not required. And then a final reason for not requiring exhaustion in this particular context, these courts have uh, looked at really a body of Supreme Court case law uh, where the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that exhaustion is not necessary 
uh, when uh, the remedies that are available are inadequate. And probably the, the case that would be uh, most arguably on point is Ryder versus Cooper, which was a case where the plaintiff was seeking monetary relief from the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, the commission had no power to award that relief, and the Supreme Court said exhaustion was not necessary in that particular context. So again, we see a number of reasons for uh, the courts on this side who are concluding that exhaustion is not necessary. The Seventh and the Eleventh Circuits have concluded that exhaustion is required for the inmate who's seeking damages, uh, but, but monetary relief is not available through the grievance process. And here, here is their reasoning. First, they've cited the, the change in the wording of the exhaustion provision, that deletion of the language, the reference to a need for the remedies to be fair and effective. And these courts are saying that the deletion of that language has some substantive meaning. In other words, that because Congress deleted that language, Congress uh, intended that prisoners be required to exhaust remedies even when it would be uh, ineffectual, even when uh, maybe it would even be unfair to require exhaustion. That is still something that Congress uh, envisioned. Secondly, these courts concluding that exhaustion is still necessary, they've said, well, exhaustion does have some value even in this context. And one reason why it has value is that through the grievance pro, pro, or the processing of that grievance, a record will be produced that would be helpful to the judicial processing of the claim. Now, whether or not that, that, that is a um, persuasive argument would probably depend on what kinds of records are being produced by the grievance processes. And, and does, anybody have, does anybody have any comments on that? Are the, is the paperwork that, that's being submitted to your court, do you see, see detailed uh, fact finding coming out of the grievance process? Almost never. Almost never is one judge's response. Anybody else seeing, seeing very detailed fact finding? No, okay. It's usually just maybe a, par a little summary paragraph. Okay, and most there's a, a, a small paragraph, maybe two, three, four sentences. Um, uh, invariably, these are uh, prepared by, uh, not by lawyers, uh, they're prepared by uh, lieutenant, correctional lieutenants and people at that level uh, who are simply extracting a canned result. Okay. There's a book okay. with a set of results. Okay, so we're hearing that at least in some states, there's, it's really kind of a boilerplate response to the grievance. It's, it's not uh, prepared by uh, lawyers. And so at least in some states, uh, perhaps the, the, uh, the written paperwork coming out of the grievance process uh, may not be so helpful in terms of facilitating judicial review. But these courts that have concluded that exhaustion is required have pointed out another value to exhaustion in this context. Uh, they have said that Although the inmate may not be able to obtain damages through the grievance process or from the grievance process, he may be able to obtain some adequate, though substitute, substitute relief. And you might wonder, well, what, what would that substitute relief be? It's hard to envision with this inmate who lost his leg what substitute relief would be. But for an inmate who is seeking a fairly small amount of damages, an example of substitute, substitute relief would be this. What inmates want more than anything, other than their freedom, very often what they want more than anything is to be transferred to another prison. They either want to be at a prison that's closer to home, or they want to be in a prison that has a lower security level. So the argument of these courts would be that maybe the inmate may not get money, but maybe they can work out some kind of a deal, and again, uh, then the courts won't be burdened with the, with the claim, et, et cetera. Perhaps that's the rationale. And then finally, the courts that are concluding that exhaustion is necessary, um, they've expressed a great concern that unless they mandate, unless exhaustion is required in this context, an enormous loophole will be created. And that inmates will just throw in a damages claim and get right into court, contrary to the intent of the um, PLRA's exhaustion provision. Now, several years ago, I did a study on different ways to reduce um, the costs of pro se inmate litigation. And as part of that study, one, one step that I took, I surveyed uh, 13 departments of corrections. 
And I did find that for those departments, uh, the only times that they would provide monetary relief to a prisoner, they all provide monetary relief for a prisoner seeking uh, money for lost or damaged property. A few provided money uh, for inmates seeking uh, compensation for miscalculated uh, state pay or commissary charges. But other than that, monetary relief was not available through the grievance process. So the reality is, again, usually inmates cannot get money for most of the claims that they would be asserting in court. I think that the, the pivotal question here, we are, of course, trying to discern congressional intent. And the real question is, what did Congress intend when it deleted that reference to a need for the remedies to be fair and effective? And there are two options. One is that the deletion of that language has substantive meaning, as we had discussed, that Congress really, really intends for prisoners have to uh, exhaust remedies even when it would be uh, ineffectual or even unfair. If an inmate uh, is experiencing uh, chest pains and uh, there's not expedited processing, uh, for emergency grievances, he would still have to exhaust, uh, even though um, it, it might be ineffective, uh, that exhaustion process in addressing uh, the alleged uh, deliberate indifference to his medical needs. So one possibility is that that language change has substantive import. The other possibility is that it is procedural in nature. And quite honestly, I don't know because the legislative history is less than illuminating on this. But the other possibility would be that this is procedural. Let me explain. Typically, with exhaustion provisions, uh, persons must exhaust administrative remedies unless the plaintiff proves that those remedies are inadequate. Under the pre-PLRA law, the system was very different. Uh, prisoners didn't have to exhaust unless the prison officials proved that the grievance process met certain standards. So it may be that that language change is simply procedural in nature, that it's kind of putting prisoners at a level playing field, and that now they have the burden, like uh, non-prisoners, of proving inadequacy of administrative remedies. But certainly a, 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 a nettlesome question confronting, confronting the courts. A, th a third issue concerning this exhaustion requirement is whether a state court remedies must be exhausted. So must the prisoner not only process his claim through the uh, prison grievance process, but also uh, file a, a tort suit in state, state court before he can bring the claim in federal court? And thus far, the courts have concluded that that's not what the exhaustion provision means. It's not demanding exhaustion of state judicial remedies. Uh, their reasoning is grounded on uh, some of the language in the PLRA, uh, the legislative history of the PLRA, and also a long-standing distinction in the law between exhaustion of administrative remedies and exhaustion of judicial remedies. Yes? Uh, have you found that lack of uh, ex exhaustion of administrative remedies is raised very often? Has there been a study of that? Uh, my impression is that it is not raised. <clears throat> you, mean, you mean by the um, by the prison officials that they're claiming lack of exhaustion? Um, well, I haven't seen it raised. I'd have to say that 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 it is uh, not frequently, but it is an issue that comes up. Now, under the PLRA, this is an this is something that um, judges are, are examining sua sponte, uh, without without any. Um, you know, exhaustion uh, uh, argument being made by the def defendants. I think it depends on the attorney general, but it's raised 98% of the time. If they spot a, any prisoner petition going through that hadn't been uh, exhausted, they're going to raise that. So. What, what Same thing is true in California. Okay, so what we're hearing is in some courts, the uh, failure to exhaust is not coming up as an issue very often, and in other courts it is coming up very often. Yes, Judge? Well, in our court, it's... Uh, Screening process is raised by the court sua sponte right. in the screening process. Right. It right. Never, it's and that's very there. that's very often the case now under the PLRA, but this does raise the question of how courts are uh, implementing this exhaustion requirement. Let me let me just say we even on this issue we do see a split between the courts as to what the prisoners' responsibilities are in terms of demonstrating exhaustion. 
Uh, the Sir Sixth Circuit has said that the prisoner has a burden of both pleading and proving exhaustion. And the prisoner must attach the administrative decision that demonstrates that exhaustion has occurred to the complaint. Whereas there are some other circuits, uh, and they would be the Fifth and Tenth Circuits, which have said that this is a, a matter which is a resolved or an issue that's resolved based on the pleadings without proof. What the Tenth Circuit has said, though, is if there is a doubt as to whether or not the prisoner is exhausted, uh, the court can uh, direct the prison officials to prepare what is called a Martinez report, basically come back to the court and report on this issue. Now, two other issues that have come up concerning the exhaustion provision that I want to cover with you, and they both relate to delay. First, the prisoner's delay in filing a grievance. And here's the question or issue. If you look at grievance processes, they always have deadlines for the filing of a grievance. And the question is this, what if the prisoner doesn't meet that deadline? Can he now come into court and, and argue that the court must process the claim because there is no available administrative remedy? The prison officials will not process the grievance because he didn't file it in time. And th this is obviously, there's a concern here that prisoners will just sit on their grievances not, not bring them to the prison officials so they can get right into federal court. So there is some um, concern about circumvention of the exhaustion requirement by the prisoners. There are a few district uh, decisions coming out of the Northern District of Illinois that have held that uh, uh, exhaustion is not required at that point. Um, the Sixth Circuit has said this, if the prisoner had notice of the exhaustion requirement, he knows he has to exhaust before he can bring that legal claim, and he had a quote, reasonable opportunity to uh, file that grievance. He cannot come into court. Well, that's, that's at least a starting point, but I think that leaves open the enormous question, of what is a reasonable opportunity to file a grievance? Now, in many systems, the time for filing a grievance is very short. It may be, for example, 14, the prisoner may have 14 days from the incident in question to file the grievance. So if the prisoner doesn't file the grievance within two weeks, does that mean he can't get into federal court? That would, in effect, be a two-week statute of limitations. And there would be some tension between a holding that bars review of the claim in, in, in that situation with some Supreme Court case law, which has held uh, that, uh, basically held that uh, four-month statute of limitations and six-month statute of limitations would not be applied um, to Section 1983 suits because uh, that's just too short of a time period. Very often people won't recognize within four months or six months that they have a compensable constitutional claim. So if that is true, certainly uh, it would seem two weeks is a short period of time. But again, uh, it's, it's, it, it is a question, uh, not as much case law as we would ex expect uh, because I think it's, it is a bit complicated. Now, one thing to look for, at least if you're in the 11th Circuit, um, some grievance processes permit the Department of Corrections to waive the deadline. So if the general, as a general rule, the inmate must file the grievance within 14 days, but for good cause, they may process this grievance if you can show there was good cause for not filing it in time. The 11th Circuit has occurred that, or I'm sorry, has held that uh, where there is that kind of waiver provision in the grievance process, exhaustion has not occurred unless and until that inmate seeks a waiver of the filing deadline. The other issue concerning delay in the um, processing of, of, of grievances would be Department of Corrections delay. Um, very often, again, the, the procedures will have deadlines for the processing of those grievances. Maybe at the institutional level, the inmate, inmate must receive a response to his grievance within 30 days and then it goes up to the next level and there must be the response within 30 days, et cetera. And the question is this, what if the correctional officials don't meet those deadlines? 30 days pass, 45 days pass, 60 days pass. Uh, at what point can the inmate uh, get, bring his claim to court when his claim, his grievance has really gone into some kind of administrative black hole? The Fifth Circuit has erected a bright line rule here. And the Fifth Circuit has held that once the deadline has passed, the remedies are deemed exhausted and the prisoner can bring his claim in court. 
Now, again, one potential complexity or to look at, and it will be important to some courts, look to see if in your grievance process there is a provision which says that if the officials at one level haven't processed the grievance in time, the inmate at that point can immediately go up to the next level. There are some courts that say with that kind of system, the inmate must go on to the next level be before his um, remedies, administrative remedies, will be deemed exhausted. So let me stop at this point and see what questions or comments you have about the exhaustion requirement. Yes, sir. Perhaps I misunderstood what you said at the beginning of uh, your lecture. Uh, you were talking about, is there a difference between administrative remedies and grievance procedures? Um, uh, or what did you, I'm... Um, okay, let's, let's look at this. Um, that is what the exhaustion requirement says, right. that administrative remedies as are available are, uh, and, and this gets to the issue of when damages are not available, must the inmate still exhaust? And those, in, those courts that have concluded that exhaustion is not required in that context have said, this provision doesn't talk about exhaustion of in, the institutional grievance procedure. It speaks of exhaustion of administrative remedies. Elsewhere in the, in the PLRA, there's a provision that uses that language, administrative grievance procedure. It says an inmate can't sue just because prison officials haven't developed such a procedure. So that difference in language, you're saying because this doesn't refer to exhaustion of institutional grievance procedure, exhaustion is not required when damages are unavailable. Okay. Other questions or comments? Okay. There is. I think it sort of defeats the, uh, the Rumbles case. Uh, one of the purposes of the grievance procedure uh, to call attention of the prison officials to the problem. Uh, uh, and it's sort of too bad that uh, uh, all the prisoner now has to do is just ask for damages and they can bypass that. And that's many prisoners, as you know, their purpose is really. Uh, not uh, a genuine purpose to obtain damages. They want to harass somebody or call attention to their plight or something like right. that. Right, right. So there is, there is the concern, that, again, as we, and, and, and I'm, we're hearing it from you, that inmates will just automatically attach that damages claim to get into court. I suppose the rejoinder would be, from, from the point that was made earlier, a response would be that, well, the correctional officials can just go ahead and make monetary relief available and close up that loophole that really the, the, the ball is in, the, in, the, in their part. And again, just two very different perspectives on this issue. Now, if inmates cross over that hurdle, the second hurdle that they have to cross over would be the filing fee requirements. Most of you would be very familiar with these requirements. Uh, there may be some, some new judges on the, on the bench, so I'm going to go through uh, uh, just the, the basics of this. Uh, how the courts have resolved the constitutional issue is a segue into a discussion of a more complex hurdle, which would be the, the three strikes provision. But basically, this is a, the filing fee requirements. It's a two-step process. And first, there will be an initial uh, partial filing fee that is assessed of when an indigent inmate uh, is, bringing, is bringing suit. And basically what, what the court will assess will be 20% of the greater of either the average monthly deposits to the prisoner's account or the average monthly balance in the account over the preceding six-month period. Now, let's assume the court does the math and, and concludes that the initial fee should be $3, but the inmate has absolutely no money in the trust fund account now. Um, and the question is, can, uh, can the suit proceed? Well, there's a proviso in Section 1915b4 that says if the prisoner uh, has no assets and no means by which to pay the initial partial filing fee, that should not and will not preclude him from um, having his claim adjudicated. Now, a couple points on this proviso. First, the Seventh Circuit has pointed out this, this reference to no means. In other words, there may be no money in the trust fund account. But if the inmate has a job and there's going to be money coming in very soon, uh, then this proviso doesn't kick in and the court should get, uh, get the money uh, before processing uh, the, the claim. Another uh, interpretation of this provision uh, comes out of the Sixth Circuit. And the Sixth Circuit has said, 
If the inmate doesn't have that three dollars, we got to go ahead and let him, um, you know, get that claim in court. But as soon as he gets some money in his account, we can withdraw that money out of the account, even if it hasn't reached ten dollars. And that's that's again the the view of the Sixth Circuit. Now. There's a second step to this, the filing fee requirements, and those, that would be the payment of in, uh, installments. And basically, what this provision, and I've got it, I'm going to read it verbatim because there's some, the courts are, are interpreting very differently this provision, but basically says that the prisoner shall be required to make the monthly payments of 20% of the preceding month's income credited to the prisoner's account, and the agency of the, having custody of that prisoner shall forward the payments uh, from that account to the clerk of the court each time the amount in the account exceeds $10 in the, uh, until the filing fees are paid. Now, just to let you know how one circuit is interpreting this provision, once again, it is the Sixth Circuit. What the Sixth Circuit is, is saying is that, let's assume again, one, once again, we do the math, and uh, the prisoner, based on the math, uh, for the preceding month, it comes to the prisoner owes $5. And what the Sixth Circuit is saying, as soon as the, there is uh, more money in the account than $10, let's assume there's uh, $12, that $5 can be taken out even though it brings the account down to $7. That is how one circuit is interpreting that provision. Now, with this provision, like many other parts of the PLRA, has provoked a lot of litigation about its constitutionality. But thus far, on this issue, we have a lot of consensus. The, we have nine circuits weighing in that the filing fee requirements are constitutional. The two main uh, objections to the filing fee pro provisions that are uh, legally based objections coming from the prisoners, they're arguing that it, it uh, infringes on right of access to the courts uh, and then a violation of equal protection. And as far as infringing on the right of access to the courts, basically what the courts are responding, they're saying, look, this initial fee is quite modest. Uh, inmates, their basic needs are met. They are provided with food and medical care and shelter, et cetera. Um, the installment provisions don't kick in until uh, there's at least $10 in the, in the account, and then there's some other reasons. So again, just um, not finding a great deal of uh, substance to that claim. And as far as the equal protection claim, of course, we know that that very often rises or falls with the court's finding as to whether or not there's a substantial um, uh, interest that's been, or a fundamental right that's been impinged by the provision. And since the right of access to the courts is not unconstitutionally impinged, the, the courts just have to look to see if there's a rational basis for this differential treatment of prisoners. Uh, and the courts have said, yes, that there is. Uh, and two of the main points that we see coming out of the opinions, again, this recurring point, inmates' basic needs are met, so it's, it's, it's entirely rational to have these, uh, these different requirements, filing fee requirements. And also, inmates have a lot more free time uh, than non-prisoners. I know they have a lot more free time than, than I do. And so that there's a rational basis for, again, requiring the payment of these fees. So again, the, the constitutional uh, objections just being uh, uh, rebuffed by the courts. Now, let's compare what the courts have, have said about the filing fee requirements to what they've said about a third uh, hurdle that inmates must, must cross in order to get their claims adjudicated by the courts. And that is known as the three strikes provision if an inmate on three or more occasions while incarcerated or detained has filed a claim that was dismissed either because it was frivolous, malicious, or failed to state a claim, that prisoner cannot bring a suit in form of papyrus, generally. So, of course, what that means, generally he must pay that full filing fee, $150 if he's filing uh, in, in, the district, in the district court, and then would have to pay the full fee on appeal. Now, there is an exception here and it has three parts to it. If the inmate's claim involves an imminent threat of serious physical injury, he can bring that suit in form of papyrus. The poor inmate can. But again, there's an imminency requirement. Uh, the injury face must be serious, and it must be physical in nature. So the question, or one of the questions raised by the three strikes provision is, is it constitutional? 
And I guess that gets into the question of, is there, is, you know, does the case law regarding the filing fee payments and their constitutionality, um, how persuasive it is or how applicable it is to this constitutional issue? Now, it's, it, it, is a, it is a bit of a different issue because whereas with the filing fee payments, there's that um, kind of the proviso, the caveat that says if the inmate has no money, he can get into court. There is no such proviso here. So there will be some instances for certain types of claims where the indigent inmate with three strikes simply is not going to get his claim into court. So the inmate who claims uh, a violation of right to religious freedom, who has three strikes, and he's poor, uh, is not going to get that claim into court. So it is a different issue. Thus far, uh, the, the courts of appeals that have addressed this, this issue have upheld uh, the constitutionality of the three strikes provision. But what I find very interesting is that we have substantial differences in, in their reasoning. Uh, so it, it does suggest to me uh, that, that it is a difficult, uh, it is a difficult and comp complex constitutional question. Let's look at the different reasonings of the, of the courts. We do have some district courts that have concluded that it is unconstitutional, but thus far no, no, no court of appeals. And, and then you give some thought to uh, which court's reasoning you find uh, most persuasive. The Fifth and the Ninth Circuits have upheld the constitutionality of the three strikes provision, and basically this has been their analysis. They said, you know, we've looked out at the case law, or looked at the case law, Supreme Court case law, and we have found that the court has upheld filing fees as long as they do not impact on a, uh, a claim uh, or uh, I'm sorry as long as they do, do not impact on a fundamental right or a claim involving a fundamental right so for example uh, persons in bankruptcy indigent persons uh, involved in bankruptcy proceedings can be required to pay a filing fee so then the next step in these two circuits analysis was was this the fifth circuit for example looked at the claim that was before the court. In this particular case, the inmate was challenging his transfer to the administrative segregation unit. That's what his claim was all about. The Fifth Circuit said there is no fundamental right to remain in the gen general population unit of a prison. So this case does not involve a fundamental right, therefore the filing fee, I'm sorry, therefore the three strikes provision as applied in this particular case is constitutional. Now, the question about the, um, this line of reasoning is simply it appears as though it's possible in these, these circuits you'd literally uh, on a case-by-case -case basis have to analyze the constitutionality. In other words, in, in some prisoners' cases there would be no uh, fundamental right implicated by the prisoner's claim, but in other cases there would be. And uh, so in those cases the, the uh, constitutional analysis and outcome might be very different. Um, and what that would require is a rather, sometimes a rather sophisticated uh, analysis before determining whether the three strikes provision uh, bars the inmate from uh, coming into uh, suit, or I'm sorry, coming into court in form of papyrus. Now the Sixth Circuit has a very different kind of analysis in upholding the three strikes provision. Basically, what the, th what the Sixth Circuit has said, analyzing uh, whether or not the provision impinges on the right of access to the courts. The Sixth Circuit has said, well, it doesn't, the Three Strikes provision doesn't unconstitutionally impinge on right of access to the courts because inmates can still bring their claims in state court. So they still have access to courts. Now, to test that, that, that line of reasoning, is, is, that, is that correct? Uh, and again, I don't know. Until we get definitive word from the Supreme Court, you don't know for sure. But what, what I do know is that there was a Supreme Court case a number of years ago, back in the 40s, where a prisoner complained because prison officials would scrutinize his uh, complaint, or they did scrutinize his complaint, and they said it doesn't, it doesn't meet the requirements that have to be met in order to file suit in federal court. The Supreme Court said that that prison official screening of the prisoner's uh, legal complaints impinged on the right of access to the courts. And here would be the question. What if prison officials only screened the complaints as far as those going to the federal court, but they let anything 
uh, any prisoner claims go to the state court. Would that mean, because they have access to the state courts, does that mean there would not be an impingement on the right of access to the courts? Uh, Sixth Circuit did also say that, uh, or did intimate that there might be some constitutional problems with the three strikes provision. The Sixth Circuit did say to the extent that any provisions of 28 U.S.C., uh, the three strikes provision, restrict the right to have arguably meritorious claims reviewed, those provisions could be deemed unconstitutional. And then finally, a very different kind of reasoning coming out of the 11th Circuit. 11th Circuit basically said inmates' access to the courts is not unconstitutionally impinged because all they have to do is pay the full filing fee. Now, does anybody have a response to that? To that? What would be the response? There is no ability to do so. Right. We're talking right now about indigent, indigent inmates. And, and, but the 11th Circuit, it was their belief, they, they, they acknowledged that the inmate might not be able to immediately pay the full filing fee, but they basically said the inmate can save up his, his dollars or pennies and eventually uh, pay that fee. Now, this is where we see a very, very great difference of opinion be, between judges as far as indigent inmates' ability to pay the full filing fee. The 11th Circuit thinks that this is, this is real, a real, realistic to expect. Uh, the district court from the Eastern District of Arkansas said that this ignores the realities of prison life. So share with me and share with us what's happening in your state. Does anybody know how much prisoners are being paid, those that, those that do have jobs, how much they are being paid in your, uh, in your own states? Anybody, th this may not be something that, that's come across your desk, but does anybody know? Yeah, we saw, I've gotten re feedback that uh, in one state, I know it's seven cents an hour. Uh, it can be, uh, I haven't been in Michigan prisons for a while, but then it was, I think it was 30 cents. Uh, you can get over a dollar for some prison industries. So again, whether or not you concur in the reasoning of the 11th Circuit may again de depend on, um, on your perception of, of what inmates and, or, and the facts about what inmates are being paid if they are employed uh, in your particular state. Um, the 11th Circuit also said inmates' right of access to the courts is not unconstitutionally impinged because they can get into court uh, if they claim that they, have, that they are facing an imminent danger of serious physical, uh, uh, f serious physical injury. Is there a response to that? Anybody got a response to that? Well, the reality is there would be some claims where the, where the indigent inmate with three strikes is not facing serious physical injury, so he won't be able to get in court, such as when there is an impingement on uh, the right to religious freedom. Um, there is in the outline a great deal of uh, case law listed about what constitutes a strike. I want to highlight uh, two issues here and how the courts are resolving them. What, one is, does a a claim that was dismissed, for example, for frivolousness before the PLRA was enacted count as a strike, and uh, thus far uh, seven, seven of the circuits have said yes, yes, that pre-PLRA dismissal does count as a strike. And then the other question is, what, what happens if we have an inmate with two strikes and then a district court dismisses his claim his third claim for frivolousness. The question is, can he appeal and be, be uh, as in form of pauper status? And what most of the courts are holding uh, that have addressed this issue, they have held that the district court dismissal does not constitute and would not be considered a strike until uh, an appeal has been either waived or exhausted. So the inmate can, can uh, bring that appeal in form of papyrus. Are there any questions about the three strikes provision or comments about that provision? Yes? With respect to the uh, retroactivity or the uh, earlier strikes, the, I believe the administrative office or the uh, uh, judicial side ha has, a, uh, has developed a database that you can, uh, was very useful federal prisoners uh, that you can, you can find out where they've been and, uh, and 
and all about the cases that they may have filed in other jurisdictions. Right. So the comment is, is that it, this gets to, again, the practical, the practical aspects of enforcing this three strikes provision. And the AO does have this uh, database set up where you can run a search and find out if the prisoner has had other lawsuits in other federal district courts. Now, it's my understanding, unless there's been some changes within the past few months, that that, uh, that database uh, does not tell the actual disposition, that there'll have to be some kind of follow-up there sometimes. But at least it's a, a good first step in trying to ascertain whether or not the uh, inmate has prior uh, strikes. It's not jurisdictional. It's the responsibility of the state to raise the defense. Right. And if and they that, don't, it's waived. As a, practical, as a practical matter, that's the other way that, that uh, this matter is coming before the court. The states do have their own records, and they'll they'll bring this. Uh, no doubt, they will bring this to the courts, to the courts attention. Now, this next hurdle that inmates must cross over, the PLRA uh, provides for sua sponte dismissal of inmate claims that are frivolous, malicious, a fail to state a claim, or seek monetary relief from uh, a defendant who is immune from uh, such, uh, from damages. One of the, uh, again, most controversial issues and also a very important question that's before the courts concerning these screening provisions in the PLRA is this. Can an inmate be afforded, does the court have the discretion to afford an inmate the opportunity to amend uh, his complaint before a sua sponte dismissal? The Sixth Circuit and the Ninth Circuits have concluded that the court does not have that discretion. That if on the face of the complaint, it right now does not state a cognizable claim, the court must dismiss the claim or complaint and cannot give the inmate the opportunity to, to amend it. Uh, 